Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Thanks so much for being with us this evening. If you could mute your microphone on the way in, that'll make things easy for everybody. It's wonderful to see so many familiar faces here this evening. We'll wait just a few minutes for the uh, room to get populated, and then we will jump in. Uh, I think everyone's aware, but just in case you're not, we are recording this session to be broadcast on the CBDNA YouTube channel later. So just be aware that we are recording. I'll wait just another 10 seconds or so to let everybody get in and then we will hit the ground running here. Welcome. All right, looks like we're in. So good evening, everybody. My name is Robert Ambrose. I'm the director of bands at Georgia State University. And it is my honor and privilege to be co-hosting uh, this session this evening about virtual performing in real time. Disclaimer, I have no expertise of any kind in this area. I was just asked to host this because I was the chair of the CBDNA COVID-19 response committee. And I'm very pleased to be doing that. But we've put together a very distinguished panel of our colleagues all of whom have had experience using a variety of different um, uh, virtual platforms uh, and, and, and had successes in real time. And you'll hear in some cases about some of the challenges they've had as well. So I'd like to begin by uh, introducing my co-host, Tanya mitchell Sprodlin, who's the director of uh, wind studies at Penn State University. And Tanya was uh, one of the members of the COVID-19 response committee and she was responsible for creating the appendix about um, uh, use of technology for remote learning. So I asked Tanya to, to join me as my co-host. And Tanya, can you just give everybody a very quick 30 second overview of that appendix uh, in the paper? Because that may be of uh, value and interest to people. Sure, and thanks Robert. I'm, I'm very happy to be here and happy to learn from my colleagues and share a little bit about how we're maneuvering um, and making progress in real time from a distance. I worked with Robert and Jason and several uh, more of our colleagues at the start of the pandemic uh, on the CBDNA COVID-19 response team. Uh, we put together a report that included ways to advocate for our music programs, as well as ideas for hybrid and remote instruction. So at the very end of the document, there is an appendix of resources and uh, a database for digital instruction. And it includes uh, recording equipment, which microphones to use, um, resources for mental health and anxiety as well, notation software, and then a whole host of recording, mixing, and editing software. So it's, it's not a definitive list, but it is a fairly exhaustive list. Some of what we'll hear a little bit later tonight will go further into depth of some of those resources. And there's also just a plethora of ideas and platforms uh, that we might not get to tonight that can be referenced later. So that document can be found on the CBDNA website and is available to anyone, uh, even if you're not a CBD, uh, CBDNA member. So with that, um, I'll turn it back over to Robert to continue with some more introductions. Thanks so much, Tanya. I just threw into the chat, uh, oh, so it looks like I actually just threw it to the one person who just privately messaged me. <laughs> I will try again. I'm going to throw into the chat in a moment a, uh, a single page document that has the contact information for all of our panelists uh, who I will introduce in a moment. Um, and the way we're gonna run the webinar tonight is it's gonna be a brief overview of each platform. Each presenter is gonna speak for seven minutes or less. And then at the end, when all eight presenters are done, we'll take any questions. And if there are more detailed or, or follow-up questions beyond that, we'll encourage you to reach out to the panelists directly to get some more information. We're gonna to try to keep this presentation to uh, an hour or just a little bit more than that. So let me introduce our distinguished panel of our colleagues who will be speaking this evening, and I'll introduce them in the order in which they will be uh, presenting. And if uh, colleagues, if you wanna just give a little wave when I introduce you, then uh, everybody will, will know who you are. Uh, first up tonight will be Dr. Jason Kasler, Director of Bands at Arizona State University. And Jason will be speaking about a platform called Lola. Then Dr. Tanya Mitchell-Spradlin will be speaking about real-time audio. 
Then uh, Antonia, as I mentioned, is at uh, Penn State as the uh, director of concert bands. Then uh, uh, Ray Sanchez, uh, Associate Dean for Strategic Initiatives and Innovation at the University of Miami Frost School of Music. We'll talk about Dante and Jamulus, two different platforms. And that will be followed by Dr. James Ripley, who's Director of Instrumental Music at Carthage College, who will also speak about Jamulus. And I'll pass it to Tanya, who will introduce our final four panelists. We're also joined tonight by James Spinazzola, the Director of the University Wind Symphony at Cornell University. He's gonna share with us about live rehearsal and NDI. Uh, Russell Gavin, Director of Bands at Stanford University, who will share about Jack Trip. David Mantini, Director of Instrumental Music at North Hennepin Community College, who will also talk about a different application of Jack Trip. And Lauren Wozenchuk, Director of Concert Bands at University of California, Riverside, who will share about Quack Trip, Nettie McNett Face, which I love saying, and Music 101. Thank you, Tanya. We're all excited to hear about Nettie McNett face. You'll have to yeah. wait for about 56 minutes to hear it. So hopefully you'll hang in that long. All right, friends, let's jump right in and uh, we'll begin with Dr. Jason Kasler from Arizona State. Jason, the floor is yours. Good evening, everyone. We are going to talk about Lola. And um, before I jump into it, uh, I want to show you what it is in action. This is how we've used the program called Lola at ASU to collaborate in real time over the internet. On stage is the ASU Wind Ensemble. On the screen above them are eight musicians uh, from the Paradise Valley School District. They are 25 miles away. And through Lola, we were able to do this. <laughs> So Lola is uh, an advanced audio video uh, system developed in Italy, and it's comprised of uh, very sophisticated software, which is free. Um, you basically have to have a gamer's dream computer. So it's got a lot of bells and whistles inside of it, but not impossible. These are, we have, we've had high school students build these things. Um, and a basic multi-track mixer that allows you to send sound out and bring it back in. Um, a high definition camera that runs through the computer. And the one thing that you need is internet two, which most of you may not even know what that is. It's probably available at your university. It's a research-based um, version of the internet that allows us to do stuff in incredibly fast time. So we've been messing around with uh, Lola for several years. Here's one of the tests we did. Again, the students were 25 miles away. I got to dust my saxophone off, so apologies. the sticky pads on my saxophone yeah um we used lola um there's a this is all i have from this thing but we recorded john mackey john's in the room here john mackey snarl which he wrote for united sound um he was at the uh, at berkeley which has which has lola and we were at asu so he was able to produce the uh, recording session from from across the country um and most recently uh when we were preparing to host um sorry, the uh, CBDNA National Conference, uh, we were premiering John's uh, Places We Can No Longer Go, 
Lindsay Kesselman was the soloist. And prior to her coming to town, she went to UNCG, which also had Lola. And we made all the connections and did the test. And so we were able to run a full length rehearsal with her 1,700 miles away. There for sake of time. Um, so that's my brief present. If you're at all interested in this, um, it's not as daunting as you think it is. Most of us have internet too at our in institutions, and I would love to find some folks that are wanting to collaborate with this once we're off and running. There's my email. Thank you so much, Jason. Really appreciate it. And everyone, if uh, you want to hold questions till the end, if you have any, just hang on to them and we'll we'll get to them right at the end. Lola stands for low latency, doesn't it? Is that where the name comes from? Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much, Jason. Uh, next, we'll move to Dr. Tanya mitchell Sprodlin, who has had some experience working with a platform called Real Time Audio at Penn State. Tanya, the floor is yours. Excellent. Uh, thank you. Um, for the start of last semester um, at Penn State, we were hybrid. We had limited rehearsals in person. And when we didn't have rehearsals in person, students led themselves in virtual rehearsals on chamber music on their off days. For, for this, we used nothing more than Zoom, uh, rehearsal recordings, digital scores, and parts. However, this semester, during our delayed start, we were 100% remote, and we tested the real-time audio box and the real-time kit. Um, and so real-time is a company that's put together equipment that then connects to an app on your phone called real-time audio. It was originally called WebJam. Once you connect, uh, you log into the app, you can see others on the platform. It looks just like Zoom, and it allows you to play together in real time. There's a slight delay, it's rather imperceptible. Um, and I really only noticed the delay when conducting. So the platform is not meant to be used as a visual rehearsal tool, though you can still see one another on the app. Um, it's designed to be totally audio first. And so this is fairly new technology that we worked on with the makers and the designers. They sat with us for a couple of the first tests and we helped work out some bugs. So we found that it worked best when whoever was running the rehearsal or leading the rehearsal would count things off or clap or use a metronome instead of trying to conduct. Um, my students commented that they could hear rather well um, and it was a useful tool for them. There is some required equipment. So the box itself is only around $50. And this is best used for two to 10 people at a time. So it's really not designed to support groups larger than 10 or 12, uh, which makes it great to use at home um, and best used at home. And that's where we did all of our tests in State College. It does require some equipment though. And so the equipment needed is uh, an interface for which if buying their kit, uh, that's provided. 
their own low latency box of a device for which to play or use the real-time app. You can use it in a phone or in a web browser. Whenever we did the test, we always used our phones. Um, and their set also comes with headphones and all of the cords you need to connect an ethernet cable. It does not come with a microphone for which uh, XLR cable microphone or microphone with a quarter inch jack is necessary. And so this was a little bit limiting because in the time frame of doing our tests, most students did not have microphones with XLR cables. They instead had microphones like this one here with USB cables that they used for their um, for their digital rehearsals with their teachers or that they used when running directly into their computers. It also requires for home use, excellent internet. And so we were asked to use an upload speed of a minimum of 15 megabytes per second. And so we often think about the download speed, not the upload speed. So, th so that's rather fast, particularly if you're in the Valley um, or fiber lines or 5G network hasn't been run in your area. So this is an image of what it looked like uh, just in my home practice. Uh, so you get an idea of how much technology and how much equipment is needed to set up. It's not too much once you have the box, the interface, um, only, only headphones used, um, no uh, speaker uh, capabilities just yet. This is another image of it with, so you can actually see the box. Um, I was working on a puzzle that day, as you can see also. And then this is another image zoomed in of the interface. Now, I'm, I think you can use a different interface with their box, different headphones as well. And we found that uh, you have to connect directly to a router. Um, it's not compatible with Wi-Fi. Uh, you can also use it with a switch. So like the one present here, if you have a Wi-Fi or an internet extender, so that you don't have to go to the basement if that's where you keep your router, you can use your internet wired in other parts of your home. It was really great to be able to use it uh, with an extender and I was really happy that it works just as well in, um, in a different location. So in terms of uh, further use and future use, it was great in that it did what it claimed to do. It did exactly what it said it was going to do. It allowed us to play together in real time. It was useful for a small chamber rehearsal. It was useful for a small sectional with just a few people. Uh, the web function is, was excellent as well because it allowed us to see each other on a screen much like Zoom as opposed to on a small uh, phone screen screen, which is what you had to do before with just the app function. The sound quality was excellent and the delay was almost imperceptible. Some cons to this and that we realized and learned in our test was it's quite time consuming to start up. If it didn't sit for about 15 minutes, the platform didn't connect correctly. So it needs a little bit of time to get loaded. Uh, you have to direct connect. So without the Wi-Fi connectivity, um, I had to go to the basement, a couple students had to go places where their router was housed, uh, which was not where they typically practiced. And so if you're not able to extend into your office or your practice room, then you have to get an extremely long uh, connector cable and set it up differently. It's several pieces of equipment, parts and cords, which is great to live in one place at home when moving around. It could be a lot in terms of cost as well. Uh, you have to have excellent internet. Uh, one thing we learned in doing our tests was that the number of students who wanted to participate were excluded on account of not having a fast enough upload speed. And so depending on your area, uh, that could be, um, that could be uh, prohibitive. However, using it on campus would help because the internet's a little bit faster. Uh, using a different interface would work well. The interface does not have a visual level indicator. So there's no indication of how loud you're playing unless someone tells you. So to be able to do that on your own on the interface would be excellent. And then the final aspect that is being worked out is there is a bug in the system and the bug didn't allow us to self host our own, um, our own room for the, um, for the test. We had to go back to the manufacturer default and so I know that they're working that out now. So if you have additional uh, questions about the real-time audio box, I'd be more than happy to share at the end or via email. Thank you so much, Tanya.
wonderful. Next is uh, Professor Ronaldo Sanchez, who's Associate Dean of Strategic Initiatives and Innovation at the University of Miami's Frost School of Music. And Ray is gonna speak with us about Dante and Jamulus. Ray, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Let me uh, share my screen here and um, tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a little bit the uh, odd person out in this uh, meeting tonight. I'm the only non-band director presenting, uh, but uh, uh, I've been up close and personal with the best in the business. I played under Fred Fennell and Al Reed and people like that. Uh, and band of the hour, uh, at, you know, and I'm a, I bleed orange and green. So I'm thrilled that I get to teach at my alma mater. Pretty amazing. And uh, honestly, when this shutdown came almost a year ago at this time, um, a lot of the technological burden fell on me. Uh, I'm a record producer by trade. I've been obsessed with distance performance since the early 90s. I worked at a recording studio, one of only two recording studios in Miami that could do distance recording uh, in the early 90s with six ISDN lines. For any of you that know technology, you know what I'm talking about. Um, I remember recording McDonald's commercials between LA and Miami real time. I thought that was just the coolest thing. Um, and not realizing that, uh, you know, how important some of that uh, experience uh, would become later on. So um, one of the things you should know is that um, it's not just the technology that's available out there, but what you have to have as the backbone is the infrastructure. So um, we require all students to have, all students at the Frost School to have a bare minimum of technology. And this was the case before COVID. Uh, what we ended up doing is, you know, the, the, the truth is not everybody got all this stuff as, as you all know how this works. Uh, but once we shut down, and especially with this, this past year's freshman class, uh, we said, you know, we got to double down on this because, you know, we have the backbone correct. As long as everybody has everything they need, I think we're going to be okay. So this is just our standard um, requirements for all students coming into the school. They're required to have a laptop that has these minimum uh, and they're about to change to upgrade to the uh, newest Mac OS and, and whatnot. But uh, this, this is the way it was at the beginning of the fall semester. Uh, we also required certain audio hardware, which included an audio interface. And this is pre-COVID. But again, we were doubling down on this now because we realized that it's not enough just to figure out how we're going to connect everybody together. They have to have the goods to be able to do this. Um, so uh, the audio interface, extremely, extremely important, as well as uh, an actual recording type microphone. Uh, we always recommend uh, for recording some kind of large diaphragm condenser. Uh, obviously for live, we recommend other things and depending on um, your instrument, for instance, our trumpet teacher really loves ribbon mic. So, okay, check with your studio teacher. Uh, they may have specific recommendations, but nonetheless, you need some kind of high quality microphone. Uh, very important in accessories, wired headphones, extremely important, a mic stand, a mic cable, and for singers, a pop filter is a nice thing to have. So uh, this is, like I said, stuff we already had in place. Um, and something else we already had in place was something called the Dante Network. It was already part of our infrastructure uh, through the recording studios and our live concert halls. Um, the interesting thing about Dante is that it's an audio networking uh, system that works with existing networking hardware. You don't need anything special. Whatever your IT folks have, it's probably going to work. Um, it worked particularly well in our new building. Uh, about a year ago this time, like within days after we shut down, the first thing I did is I picked up the phone and called 
some others that are pretty tech savvy at the school and said, okay, let's get together. Let's see if we can get Dante working between our rooms. Because if we can get Dante working between our rooms, we know we can isolate musicians in one room, um, you know, like for instance, a singer in one room and the professor and the accompanist in another room. Uh, because, you know, um, I wasn't too worried about our music engineering folks, our production folks. They've been using this stuff already. They've been collaborating remotely for quite a while. I was worried about the folks that mostly work and collaborate in a live setting. So um, within the first week after the shutdown, we realized this is actually going to work um, even uh, you know, with, with the existing hardware, with everything we have in place. So for what we ended up doing is for our classical and jazz areas, we built eight live rooms, actually four pairs, basically student in one room, professor or professor and accompanist in another room. Um, custom PC laptops for those rooms. Uh, using Focusrite Scarlet 816-856 eight interfaces because there were times when there would be more than one musician in one room. So we had to have more inputs, potentially, at least have the option for that. Um, the standard was a Rode NT4 XY stereo mic, which basically gave the feel of being in a live room you know, somebody at the very least could just walk in, start singing, start playing. The computer was already on. The teacher was already on, on the other side. They could hear each other. They could talk to each other. Um, and uh, very important, um, stereo headphones, because unfortunately, technology is not nearly as evolved as the human mouth and human ear. We don't feed back to each other when we speak and listen, but when we have open microphones and open speakers, we feedback. Uh, so right now, you know, I have my in-ears because if I had my speakers on, you might be hearing a delay or some weirdness. So uh, headphones are extremely important. Uh, we chose semi-open because instrumentalists and singers really want to hear themselves as well. I'm a guitarist, so I like the close back, but I know for most musicians and most singers, that's not the case. Um, for our contemporary popular music folks, we did this with all rooms, but that was actually pretty easy because all we had to do was buy Dante Via licenses. They're only $50. And using their existing uh, digital audio workstations, they could connect to each other. Um, and um, a student, potentially, we figured out that a student in select rooms in the school, including some practice rooms, could actually connect to other studios this way as well. Um, again, using existing hardware. But that was all inside the School of Music. That was all inside our infrastructure. The holy grail for me is really, how do we get to the outside? Because even though we opened in August, when we were, I was teaching hybrid in August. I've been there since the beginning. Um, a little bit less than half of our students were remote in the fall semester. This semester, most students are actually on campus. I think I heard the statistic was only about 15% remote, but nonetheless, we still have to deal with them. So how do you get somebody who is in Philadelphia playing with somebody that's in Miami. And I honestly, folks tried everything. Um, by the way, Lola, I love Lola. This is something we're definitely going to look at and, and try to build in. Uh, in 2009, pre-Lola, we have internet too. We did a collaboration with the popular music program at the University of Southern California, where we performed together, rehearsed together and performed together uh, using Internet to pre-Lola using VLC and other other technology that was pretty primitive compared to Lola. I'm really excited about the possibilities with that. But there's an issue. Jamulus solved that issue for us. 
So what is Jamulus? And I'll tell you what the issue is in a second, because a lot of you are going to face the same circumstance. So this is right from their website. It's for playing, rehearsing, or just jamming with your friends. Okay. I've heard this kind of stuff before. Yeah, show me. I'm a Cuban raised in Missouri. You got to show me twice. But you know what? Jamulus showed me twice because it actually works. It's unbelievable how easy it is to get it to work. Um, high quality, low latency sound. Um, just two weeks ago, I was jamming with friends, playing, you know, pretty high level with, with some really high level musicians playing really tight stuff with the drummer and everything on the other end. And we were in sync. I mean, it was amazing. And I was here in my home. I, I do have wired internet that is required. Uh, but other than that, as long as you have a minimum of upload and download speed, you can totally do this. So what is, what are the pluses? It works, it's free, it's simple to use. And most importantly, it can be used behind our university firewall. This is the problem. Jam Kazam, Jack Trip, a lot of the other solutions require IT to punch a hole in the firewall, open up a port, and be able to stream through that. Jamulus doesn't when you're using a quote unquote public server, but there's a very simple way to make your quote unquote public server private but it does in fact work behind the firewall. I've confirmed that our students are using it, working with people on campus to off campus. Um, it's, it's, it's a really amazing solution. It does require, of course, the audio interface, the microphone, and of course, headphones. So that's it for me. Uh, look forward to the rest of this conversation. Thanks so much, Ray, appreciate that. Sure. James Ripley from Carthage College is going to chat a little bit more about Jamulus and some of the experiences he's had working with that. James, the floor is yours. Thank you. Just building directly off of what you just heard, the other element as far as the tech end of that, that I would say that it seems to work best if you have also a microphone and the headphones can actually plug into that microphone with a with an eighth inch jack if that is there then the system tends to work a little bit better within itself it can still be worked around but what i wanted to do is to just share a screen just for a second for this because this is the thing that i like the best about jamulus you connect and you're there. It is that simple. Um, I'm, I'm not smart enough to figure out a lot of this other stuff. And when we got together in the fall to talk about how we were gonna serve the students, um, we were lucky we have on our campus an Emmy award-winning computer science guy that does um, uh, all sorts of graphic design in Hollywood. And he just came in and said, you've got to try this. We've got a server in Chicago that'll handle anything. And that is part of the things. Your university may have a server that's big enough to handle some of the requirements that Jamulus would require. Ours didn't. We needed to actually go offline. But all of our signals go to Chicago, which is about 45 miles away, before it actually comes back to us on campus. And that still works. And we have a, a student uh, that is in Denver right now um, that's remote that is going uh, in our Jamulus uh, room right now and it's working great for her. Um, the downside is that it's not a visual platform. It, it all, is all audio, but it works great for chamber music. And so our first iteration was to look at Jamulus with having a couple of different rooms for half of our ensemble to meet and the bands would be able to play at the same time that just required a little bit more hard wiring than what the college was willing to undertake. We would have actually had to go through some uh, brick and mortar and, and move some, uh, some wires around. And so instead we ended up doing some other things in the fall. Stop it. But as far as the, um, uh, the second semester now, when we've come back, 
we've been able to do really some wonderful chamber music uh, rehearsals using Jamulus. And um, the other part of that um, that I was just going to say is that, you know, um, the, the student interaction with this is actually what's been the, the best part of it because they're still there even with their friends in Denver. So with that, I'll, I'll just put in a plug for Jamulus. Make sure you've got a big enough server and, um, and life is good. Thank you so much, James. Tanya? And so to share with us a little bit about live rehearsal and NDI is James Spinazzola, director um, at Cornell University. So James, take it away. Thanks, Tanya. Uh, one second here. Okay, so um, at Cornell, we're using two software applications, one with the aspirational title, Live Rehearsal. We were hoping that we would actually be able to have live rehearsals with this application. And um, that actually is now happening. And NDI, um, an interesting video protocol that's also been very useful for us. Um, so what we've got is essentially a hybrid wind ensemble rehearsal program uh, involving 37 student musicians and these two software applications. Live rehearsal enables us to um, achieve bi-directional low latency audio and NDI studio monitor, which is another free app, uh, enables one-way conductor video. Our student population is divided into three types of rooms. In our main rehearsal space um, is me and a 13-member brass section. Our secondary rehearsal room, we have four members of our six-member percussion section. Sadly, that was the amount of students we could fit in the room with um, proper distancing. And in other classrooms throughout the music building, everything from a practice room to um, a, a regular lecture room, we have 20 uh, woodwind players in individual rooms. And so this is essentially the setup in our large rehearsal space. Um, I'm conducting the brass section and we have a, a matched stereo set of Rode ET5 uh, microphones capturing their sound. Then 20 woodwinds are in individual practice rooms. They're all listening on, on closed ear headphones and they're seeing me um, um, on their laptop through the NDI video protocol. So there's one of my alto saxophonists um, in the course of, of rehearsal. Um, another tenor saxophonist in a different room, a bassoonist in another room, um, and the percussion section. Uh, this is in a smaller rehearsal space uh, across the hall from where I am. And live rehearsal was written by two of my students, um, senior uh, um, music majors at, with a, a, an additional major, um, Alex Coy, uh, and I want to say their names because I'm so proud of them. Alex Coy is an electrical and chemical engineering major, and James Parker is a computer science major. And essentially what they've done with live rehearsal is they've created um, a, a rehearsal solution that integrates existing sound broadcasting applications uh, into a secure and simple inter interface, very similar to what you saw in, in Jamulus. And so they've created a single button bundle that you simply download and click and drag to the applications folder like you would with anything else. It was primarily coded in C++ um, and the, um, they had to leverage some other platforms to create the graphical um, user interface. Jack and Jack Trip is the foundation that enables the, the um, the low latency interface with the, um, the computer through the audio um, interface, and then Jack Trip sends that over the internet. Um, the students also wrote a server program that enables us to um, use an on canvas server to manage all of this information. So um, with live rehearsal, a user logs in, um, the app automatically stores their username in a database. And then that same student provided they're using the same um, computer um, is able to, to log in um, infinitely without having to re-authenticate. Once logged in, you choose three user types, uh, a member, a chef, and a super chef. Um, the member is able to broadcast their audio. Um, 
They also are able to mute themselves. They have a local audio loopback toggle, which enables them to adjust their sound without everybody having to hear them do it. And then they have a, um, an online loopback toggle so they can check latency before they start. What we found is sometimes, um, the only time there's discernible latency, it's uh, typically it's just like a restart your computer kind of thing and it fixes it. Um, so that enable enables them to go through that step. They also have access to a chat box so we all can communicate um in writing so i'm able to type in you know clarinet 1a sound check and not have everybody have to hear it the chef has mixing capabilities and so i'm sort of like as the conductor i'm sort of the hub with um each of the of the members of the ensemble as, as a client one thing that was really important um, to me as we were building the application was security. Um, we've created a VLAN, a virtual LAN in our, um, in our music department. And so it's not currently public facing, but we want it to be eventually public facing. And so the students built encryption into, um, into the app um, just to make sure that, that we're safe because we are transmitting information over the internet. And so no audio port is opened until that Authentica authentication process is complete. And so let me just show you real quickly here. The only bug we found is you now have to kick it off in terminal um, with um, the switch to Big Sur on Mac. And so um, you, you open it up, you click, this is our server name, our server port and my username. You click connect, you choose your privilege and if I'm a member, this, there it is. And so um, I've got my name, the uh, parameters are already assigned. Um, I'm able to enable encryption. I can check my loopbacks. I can start Jack, that gets me rolling. I can start Jack trip and now I'm on and you might be hearing some clicking um, because I'm not plugged into my um, interface. So. Let's get back here. And so that took care of the audio piece, the video piece. Um, I'm using uh, NDI video, Network Device Interface. This is ultra low latency um, using a new protocol called NDI HX2. Um, you can achieve low latency as well as low bandwidth usage. Um, video monitor, it's called Studio Monitor on Mac, comes as part of a free um, download suite of applications called NDI Tools. And so basically, we're using this camera. This is a wonderful little camera. It's a $400 camera from Ida, a full HD camera. It's a power over internet camera, so you don't have to plug it in. Um, you, you plug in the ethernet cable, and then anybody that's privileged on that network can see the video feed. And so I have this pointing at me in rehearsal, and students are, we've, um, we've been able to link it up, so, so the latency matches, and they're able to see and hear me um, regardless of wherever they are in the building. The only problem with this is it limits us to Ethernet, um, whereas um, live rehearsal like Jack is, is um, doable over Wi-Fi as long as you have a strong connection. Um, NDI is not. So we all are wired in. I'm going to skirt through um, the hardware requirements, um, but I wanted to put them on the slides. If you're interested in, in receiving the information, please just um, send me an email and I'll send you the slides. Um, but there, there are hardware uh, requirements that have been previously referenced um, tonight. I did want to show you um, a photo quickly of our student station. And this is basically what every student has. Um, this, this, um, the interface here is, is a more advanced one, um, much lesser interfaces work. This is just because we happen to have it already. Um, but a student comes, they swipe their ID card, um, they check out a student station, which includes all of this stuff. They take it to the room, set it up, and we begin rehearsal. And we've been able to bring that down to about just slightly under 15 minutes for all of that to happen. So 15 minutes set up, 30 minute rehearsal, mandatory 30 minute downtime. So the room's clear. One more 30 minute rehearsal, 15 minutes pack up. And there's our two hours. Um, and regarding the network, there are specific requirements, but they're no different than any other internet, um, ethernet based system. Um, so 
it's very brief and I'm sorry for that, but um, it's an introduction. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to shoot me an email. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks so much, James. Uh, next, Russ Gavin will share how Jack Trip is used at Stanford. So Russ, the floor is yours. Yeah, one thing I want to make sure everybody knows right out of the gate, Jack Trip, when you hear that word, is an open source software. So it's been around like a while, like legit 20 years was when the original code was written in a very experimental way right here uh, at Stanford. And what's happened with that software, as you heard uh, in James's presentation, is it's been applied in a lot of different ways. What happened on our camp campus was a real serendipitous moment where all these folks who are thinking about computer music started interacting with all these folks thinking about ensemble music. And there was one engineer in particular who had a son who sings in choir and it's a boys choir and it's the most important thing in his life. And he was like, I bet we can fix this. And his fix uh, turned into what is now called the Jack Trip Virtual Studio. And that's what I'm gonna be talking about a good bit about tonight. Uh, but I want to first show you the outcome. Uh, I will be sharing a choral video in a band space, so everybody put on the appropriate positive energy and love our choir friends. But this is from last night, because I just grabbed it. This is 40 seconds of young people. This is 8 to 16 year olds. There are over 50 of them, all coming in from their home internet connection with download speeds as poor as uh, five to 10 megabytes. So let's see how they do. Awesome. And so what I hope you heard, I hope you heard chords. I hope you heard as good a timing as we may love from our eight to 15 year olds uh, in that space. Uh, but you heard music making and, and you may have also seen a conductor engaging just for full uh, disclosure. That was a Zoom video uh, that was delayed just a little bit to make sure the conductor lined up. So it looks uh, the ability to actually conduct in real time as a work in progress. But it'll get there and how this came to fruition. I'm actually just gonna be sharing aspects of the Jack Trip website right now. So just if, if any of this is inspiring to you, go check it out, jacktrip.org. But it's, it is the same, it's a plug and play device that you see a lot of folks are using. It does need to be wired into the ethernet, but uh, you know, the audio out and the audio in, it's a, it's a little quirky, but it's very straightforward. This whole thing was designed knowing that it had to be used with 10 year olds. And so the fact that it had that threshold and a lot of them and a lot of them singing uh, means that it cleared nearly every hurdle that I think we need in band land uh, right out of the gate in a, in a lot of ways. Uh, and so an individual gets this box, they plug it in, they register it online, and then the server. So we've heard the talk about server a few times tonight. One of the beauties of the Jack Trip Virtual Studio that I love because I am not techie, right? Don't let the Stanford.edu fool you. I, I'm lucky to turn the computer on. And this application, it's all cloud-based. So that means that everything that you are doing, there's very easy manipulation uh, of the server itself. The firewall issue is relatively non-existent once you get the setup right. We heard that uh, earlier before, um, but because it's a cloud-based server and you're just running your line right to it, uh, it's pretty easy to connect to. Uh, high quality audio, um, something that's important to mention, It does, Jack Trip really does, it, it allows for this full lossless audio, this 48 or 96 uh, kilohertz. In this platform, and this is really important to me because it touches on accessibility, uh, this platform actually integrates Jamulus and JackTrip. So Jamulus takes less bandwidth. So we right now have 5,000 users around the country, including kids 
uh, you know, who are just regular kids at a home with an internet that can barely support two people on Netflix. But because we integrated Jamulus, boom, they can get on and play or sing. Uh, the latency that we experience in this platform tends to hover around 15 milliseconds. If you, the further you get away from one of these cloud-based servers, it goes up. And so, uh, but as a good example, right now we have multiple musicians jamming regularly LA to San Francisco. So that's about 400 miles and it comes in super tight. And, you know, when it comes to the bands, uh, the largest group we have using it right now is a 90 person wind symphony. We have a youth symphony with 90 folks getting on three hours every Monday night as if it were normal. And forgive me that I keep saying we, but just being kind of the ensemble guy on the project out here, I definitely have a sense of ownership and excitement about it. Um, but yeah, that accessibility was such an important part of this to us uh, because yeah, like you can't can't have some can't have anybody left out, right? Um, does support large groups. The largest concert we've done did have 250 people simultaneously on a server. Uh, we've done it synthetically up to 500. But if anyone would ever like to get a 500 person band in a virtual space, let me know. That's a little bit, <laughs> it, you know, you got a lot of sound coming in there. Uh, and, and this is the last thing. If you want to use your own server, you can. It's empowered to drive that. But um, if you want to use one of the cloud-based servers, uh, it's geographically limited right now. We have 40 server locations worldwide, but by summer, we will probably have 95% of the world population within range of one of our servers to facilitate it. Um, yeah, and that's it. It does cost, uh, similar to some of this other stuff, the box itself is about 150 bucks and you're gonna need some components around it. But man, it, it works. And you know, I one of the coolest things here, as soon as I plugged this thing in and started, uh, I, you know, I, did the, I did one of the whole suites because I was like, let's just do something that I'm not gonna get in trouble by, you know, some, <laughs> uh, the, it was amazing. It was immediate. And I have seen more conductors, uh, especially as we were onboarding them in September and October, they get on there and it's so real. Like I've, I've literally seen four conductors to date tear up because it allows virtual music engagement. So it, I do believe as a profession and it may not be what I'm hanging out with out here, but it's somebody's going to keep building on this. I think this is an important part of our future as an instrumental music education profession. And anybody that wants to chat about that or get more information about the virtual studio and the things we're doing out here, hit me up. I, I, can, I obviously love talking about it. I think, it's, I think it's cutting edge and I wanna make sure our population are at the leading edge of that evolution. Excellent, thank you, Russ. To share a little bit more about Jack Trip and its application at North Hennepin Community College is David Mantini. So David, take it away. All right. Um, if you want to talk about somebody that's basically a Luddite with all this process, it's uh, pretty much me. Um, I had to farm out. Uh, I identified Jack Trip as something that we could use, but really had to have um, our IT department uh, kind of take it from there. So um, we're, we're a community college, we're non-residential. Um, we also rehearse in the evenings once a week. And I have an age range that I'm dealing with uh, from 16 to, they won't tell me how old they are. Um, so as far as giving them stuff to do at home or being able to connect in that way, um, we did half of the term uh, this past fall through Zoom rehearsals at home, and then we got together using all the mitigation techniques and everything else. So we have half the band sitting on um, sitting on stage. Sorry. See, I'm proving right off the bat here that I'm very much a Luddite. Um, can't even run my PowerPoint. So this is roughly what we have set up. Half the band was in the band room. The other half is going to be up on stage. And we're running Jack Trip as a server in one space. And then the other Jack Trip is running in the other room. Um, as far as what equipment we're using, we've got some PGA-1 mics, uh, 
running through a board, running through our um, interface to a computer. It's not quite that old, but hey, it's a good image. All the way back through and into speakers because we had no budget to get headphones or do anything like that. Um, so then the whole setup from the room runs into here, output from the stage only, stage to the band room, and output to the band room as well. When we recorded, I was wearing headphones in the band room and conducting to the other side. The audio stuff worked really, really well, but the problem was is that we couldn't generate enough sound in the other rooms because we would feedback. So the solution for that is that we ended up using an analog monitor. I don't know if you guys can see that down there. One of my band members had 200 feet of cable sitting around at home and an old analog TV because we tried using um, just a regular, you know, setup across campus that um, IT could do for us, but it didn't work um, because there was lag. The, you know, I was conducting half a beat behind, so no one is able to stay together across the two rooms. Um, when we did hook up the analog, so I'm conducting in this space, and they're witnessing, the other half is on stage and watching from there. Um, we used digital TV and an Ethernet to connect to the other side so that I could see what they were doing and when they were panicking and lost and all that other stuff. Um, what was really cool is combining those two, we could play together and doing, of course, the 30 minutes in, 30 minutes out, all that type of stuff. But we really only had access to two rooms on campus. Um, so things that I would do differently, multi-input interface so that I can plug and end up using a DAW instead of trying to use the board to mix some stuff, um, headphones. Headphones, headphones, headphones. Um, that, of course, in COVID times brings up a whole other issues. They have to be assigned their own headphone, et cetera, et cetera. Um, closed circuit TV going both ways. Within um, uh, a year or so prior to this, our IT department got rid of all, all of its analog stuff. So they had nothing sitting around. Mm -hmm. So again, really happy that we had that gentleman who had all that stuff at home. And then I want to learn how to do jack trip myself. Um, ran into several nights when uh, luckily my son plays percussion. And he's in an audio engineering program. Managed to help get us back online. Moving forward, right now our, we're using jack trip with our jazz band. We have the jazz band in the band room and we have the vocalists on stage. And we are connecting with them back and forth in real time. Um, we're looking at getting the multi-input interface as well as um, the hub applications so that we could potentially use multiple rooms across campus if we need to. Um, this is a little bit of what we were able to do this past fall. And out of respect for everybody else's time, too, I'm going to stop there. Um, if you do have any other questions, our application was a little bit different because we were able to split the band and actually be kind of face-to-face. -face. Uh, just didn't have the space anywhere on campus to put us all in the same room. Um, Got to say, I'm really impressed with everything I'm hearing here. It's some great ideas. So thank you. Oh, thank you, Dave. I don't know if, if it was the case for everyone else, but I wasn't able to hear your audio in the uh, video that you just shared, but we all have your contact information. And so I'm sure you might have some people reaching out to share. Um, so that was wonderful. Our last presenter tonight is Lauren Wozenchuk. She's going to wrap it up with her experience with Quack Trip, Nettie McNett Bass, and Music 101. So Lauren, the floor is yours. Okay, excellent. Hi everyone, it's so wonderful to connect with 
you all and be a part of this. I'm so excited to be here and thank you again for having me. I'm the director of the UC Riverside Concert Band and I've been with them for a little over a year now. We had about a month of in-person rehearsals and unfortunately had to get shut down to the pandemic. So we've had all this time completely virtual. And so I'm gonna jump right in to talk about our work together. So before I get into the applications that we used, it's really important for us, uh, well, it was important when we first began to understand what are we working with and to understand the different methods of connection. So first you have on my left, the hub and spoke, which you're all familiar with as we are using Zoom. Um, you have the central hub where everyone's connecting and receiving and sending information. And then on my right, we have peer to peer when you completely get rid of that server and people can connect quite freely. So going into Jack's, uh, excuse me, Quack Strip, <laughs> Quack Trip Suite, it's very similar to Jack Trip as we all have heard about. Um, and I'm going to talk about today Music 101. But for the three that we have, we have Quack Trip, which is one to one. So if you're jamming with a friend, this is the peer to peer model. You don't need any server whatsoever, and it's very accessible. All of these here are apps that you download. So all you need is just the download link, and you're ready to go. Netty McNet Face. I know the name is quite funny. It's a take on Bodie McBoatface. If you're familiar with the Royal Vessel, there was this big naming contest and they people voted and they love Bodie McBoatface and unfortunately didn't stick um, with the British, but um, that's where it comes from. So in short, this is a group of 12 people that you can meet. And um, ideally you wanna do more like eight because anything more you might risk losing um, quality of sound. But if your internet connection is really good, 12 people, you're good to go. And this uh, is the peer to peer model. And then finally, Music 101 is a group of more than 12 people and you can do up to 100 people maximum. And this is really great because it introduces the server, the hub and spoke model, but you have the efficiencies of the peer to peer model. So it made it really accessible for us to use in the ensemble setting. So what you will need, a computer, of course, a strong internet connection, and I have a link here, speedtest.net, which is excellent. So you can test your speed of all the people in the group that you're working with and whoever has the fastest. Um, I'll, I'll mention that later, but that's going to be important. You need an audio, audio interface recommended, an external microphone, as well as wired headphones and an ethernet cable connection to the router is strongly recommended. We had students when we did this, people who did not have an ethernet cable, but were able to get quite close to the router and we were still able to make it work effectively. And then finally, you will need the Mac or Windows version of the app that you plan to use. And the link is here, which I will send to you, send to you all later. Okay, so setting up Music 101. As soon as you download the app, this is what you will see. And it's very accessible. It's um, something that I'll, I'll talk about just in a moment on how you set it all up. But unlike Jack Trip, Jack Trip is very, very good, but you need to know how to work with code. If you have a specialist, that's really, really important. And um, the person who created this, Miller Phuket from UCSD, he, there was a lot of talk and people were saying, look, you know, there must be a way for us to create a type of Jack Trip, but making it accessible for people who aren't as tech savvy. And so that that's like me and a lot of my students, especially during this time in the pandemic. And so this is what we ended up using. And so over here to my right with these screenshots, this is everything that's already set up for you. I just wanted to show so you can verify your, um, your settings before you start working with this. So using Music 101, so everything in red is what you will need to adjust. So for the channel name, this you would, oh, excuse me, I just went back. Um, you need to have all of the students that you're working with give you their name. The, in this case, we use the student IDs. And so that served as the channel. We did not use any call name. We're hoping to embark on that this coming quarter call name, you could do a main room, you could also do a series of rooms if you wanted to have a sectional with just the brass while you worked with the wood 
ones, for example, you could put brass and then they would go to that specific room with the other colors. And then for the server, we used the server with UCSD because that is the closest to us. However, we finally have a server that's finally in-house, which is very exciting that we're going to use this next quarter. So if you're looking to do this, I highly recommend getting your own server or if you have a server that's really close to you, you utilizing that for the best possible connection. And then here with the arrows, um, with the delay, you want to make sure that that's, that's low, as well as the drops. And if you're getting a lot of numbers here in the drops, um, that you want to increase your delay so it gives you a little bit better connection. And then for the send and receive, you want to just bring up that black marker at the bottom up to the midpoint, and that's going to give you the best quality of sound. So here um, we have our chef, which we heard I know earlier, but you want to have one person in control of the whole mix. And so that person is responsible for collecting all of those student names and then putting them in this configuration that you see here. And again, this is already set up for you. You just get the names, you enter, and then you're good. And there's lots of tutorials on this Music 101 and this whole system quack trip suite that gives you how uh, the information with how to do that. So connecting to Music 101. So this is what it will look like as soon as you're connected. After you hit the call button, you'll see um, the send and receive signal and all that's ready to go. And then these pink squares here, that's everyone that has a signal. And that tells the chef, OK, who's coming in really hot or who's co not coming in enough. And um, you have the volume on the left hand side of these rectangles. And then you're able to pan as well. Um, which is the, the horizontal uh, rectangle above each person's name. And what's also great is there is a little toggle where you can click on an individual student and have them do a solo or just to check in on how their playing is. And so this is quite accessible and really user friendly. And I like it because you can also configure your group how you might hear it in the rehearsal setting with the panning. So if you want, you know, low brass to come in more on this side versus, you know, the other instruments, you know, trumpets and, you know, clarinet, whoever you have positioned, it gives you more of that semblance of a real time time um, rehearsal, even though we're virtual. And um, so to get in touch with me, here's my email. And this would not be possible without the collaboration we have with the Experimental Acoustics Research Studio. And Ethan Castro, he's the graduate manager of EAR's student group. And what's really exciting going into this next quarter is we're going to offer a series of tutorials and seminars. So if you want to learn more about telematic performance and anything technology related to so please get in touch and we're, we're happy to help. This is so new and exciting for us. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Lauren. Uh, there's lots of excellent information tonight, and we did a very, very quick overview <clears throat> of several different tools and platforms. So I wanted to remind you all that if you have pointed questions for any of us, or you want a more in-depth presentation or information about application, please don't hesitate to reach out using the document of email addresses that Robert dropped in the chat. It has all of our information so that you can follow up with any of these platforms. And um, now I will open it up to a few questions and I'll pass it over to my, uh, to my colleague, Robert. Thanks everyone. Uh, before we take questions, uh, panelists, if you wanted to share any of the presentation materials that you presented, please feel free to drop those in the chat. Um, I think that would be very valuable if, it, if it's something you feel you can share. Um, I dropped uh, two different PDFs in the chat, the second of which is the most accurate. I had mistyped one email address and I apologize. So the one you'll want to look at and double click on to open is the real time webinar panelists um, contact information. It, it, I just dropped that in at 906. That has all the panelists uh, contact information on it. Uh, in the few minutes that we have left, are there any questions that anyone has? Uh, feel free to just unmute your microphone and identify yourself and then go right ahead. Oh, Ray, do you have something before we do that? Yeah, no, I, I actually, um, Lauren, as you were just talking, I, I went on the, uh, you know, on the website. Um, I noticed that you have, there's a VST plugin for Quacktrip. Have you used that? Is 
Not yet, not yet. We're looking into more of that in the, in the spring quarter. This is all very new for us, so we wanted to start small and start okay. with chamber groups. We finally got to the full group, but yeah, that's coming soon. But I can yeah. connect you with Ethan, who has done oh, absolute, that. Absolutely. Um, that, because that, the moment I saw that, it was like, okay, yeah, that's something we could use. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. Any other questions at all for any of our panelists? Well, hearing none, I'd like to thank our president and fearless leader, Mark Speed, for uh, it, creating this opportunity this evening for, uh, for our colleagues to share with each other. Mark has done so much for our profession and uh, we owe him a, a huge uh, amount of gratitude. And thank you, Mark, for continuing to serve and continuing to find ways for, uh, for us to interact and learn and, and move ourselves uh, forward here as a team. So. Everyone, if there's no other questions, you have the contact information of our panelists. We thank you so much for joining us this evening. Panelists, I'm gonna ask you to stay in the room for just a moment to do a, uh, a quick little discussion that won't take more than two minutes. Everyone else, it was wonderful to see so many familiar faces this evening. All the very best to you and take care, friends. Bye-bye. <laughs>